Welcome back to Shannon's Club TV, where we celebrate classic Australian road and competition cars. In today's episode, we have a rare opportunity for a side-by-side -side comparison of our two feature cars. We'll also meet their proud owners and get the latest market news from the Shannon's auctions team. But first, let's take an up-close look at the unbreakable French cars that won plenty of fans in Australia, the Peugeot 203 and 403. The Peugeot 203 and 403 were, in my view, the first true post-war world cars. The 203 was launched in Europe in 1948 and assembled in Australia from 1953, while the 403 arrived both in Europe and Australia in 1955. It was no fluke that the Peugeot 203 was internationally successful. The engineering brilliance it incorporated was the work of a notably focused company which made bicycles and many other items before starting on cars in 1904. When a Peugeot 203 won the 1953 Red X trial, Wheels magazine declared the myth that the only car suited to Australian conditions was the large American vehicle had been exploded. <laughs> Oddly forgetting the Holden. Mark, that, that Red X win in 1953 was huge news, wasn't it? Oh, it sure was. I mean, it really opened people's eyes, particularly in Australia, to what Europe could offer in comparison to the 48215 Holden. You've got to keep in mind though, these French manufacturers, Peugeot, Citroën, Renault, they had to build cars that were tough enough, not only for bumpy sort of rural roads in France and Europe, for Africa. but all those far flung French colonies, yes. um, the West Indies, the South Pacific Islands, and of course, Africa. So these cars had to be really, really tough to withstand that yes, sort of treatment. that's a very good point, mm. indeed. The 203 had rugged long travel suspension with a well-located rear axle with torque tube. It used a transverse leaf up front. This car had a supple ride at odds with its physical dimensions. Australian roads were tough, of course, but so were French roads, and Peugeot still made its own dampers. While superior suspension was one advantage, gearing was another. With its overdriven fourth gear, the 1.3 litre pug could cruise at its top speed of 71 miles per hour, faster than a Holden. And when the road started to twist, the 203 was off into the future. In 1954, the 203C arrived with Synchro on first, a rare mainstream sedan feature for the day, and it also had a full camping body. The 403 was a bigger car with a 1468cc engine to match. Power was up from 45 to 58 horsepower. Maximum speed climbed to a Holden matching 128 or 130 kilometres per hour. Capable of 65 miles per hour in third, a 403 could overtake a truck as quickly as a Holden could because the Australian car had to rely on torque in top gear. The elegant Farina designed Peugeot 403 was a driver's delight. Precise, beautifully balanced, supple, subtle. Arguably, it took over the mantle from the Holden as the best car in the world for Australia. There was even a long wheelbase wagon version as well. Mark, there was no Holden in the first Armstrong 500, right. but I don't think Australia's own could have matched the pug, <laughs> do you? Well, given that Australia's own at the time was the FB Holden, I certainly would have had my money on a 403, you know, which, like the 203, was custom made for harsh treatment. Peugeot's 203 and 403 established the French firm as one of the world's finest car manufacturers in the 1950s and 60s. Their mechanical endurance and ability to travel over rough roads and vast distances with great comfort built a legion of loyal customers, particularly in Australia, where success in the Red X and Ampol trials, plus the Armstrong 500, proved they were ideally suited to our harsh conditions. Peugeot could not have asked for a more credible demonstration of its engineering than the famous victory by Ken Tubman and John Marshall in the first Red X trial in 1953. Their stock standard 203 covered the then unfathomable distance of 6,500 miles in under two weeks across a brutal continent renowned 
for its deplorable road network. The pugnacious 1.3 litre sedan not only won, of equal significance was that all 11 of the 203s entered also made it to the finish. Suddenly everyone was talking about the little known French car which conquered the Red X and it came awfully close to winning the 1954 and 1955 events as well. John, looking back, you know, the 203 was in, in a lot of ways like a French version of our 48215 Holden. So the question is, which would you prefer out uh, of those two? <laughs> <laughs> Come on, you love your French cars. Absolutely, the Peugeot 203. Mm. It, was, it really was a superior car. The only area where the Holden had the edge on it, mm. and this was important in Australia, was it really had the, the torque and the open yeah. road performance. I mean, mm. you've got to bear in mind that in those days we didn't have divided roads mm. and you had to overtake lorries on yes. the Hume Highway. Mm. So there the Holden really had the advantage. But when you move on to the next generation, the 403, which would do 65 miles an hour in third mm. gear and another gear to go. Very impressive. Versus the time. Holden, which ran mm. out of second gear at 50 miles yeah. an hour. Yeah. You'd probably rather be in the Peugeot than the Holden mm. overtaking your truck on the Hume Highway. So Peugeot had absolutely made up for any shortfall it had earlier had compared with the Holden. It's interesting though, perceptions at the time, because people referred to us, quite often see references in historic material, those funny little French cars. Yes. But when you look at the dimensions of a 203 against a 48215 Holden, they're, they're very, very close. They weren't, you know, they not had much, this perception of not small. Much I think, I think yeah. the late, great Bill Tucky popularised that phrase, but mm. he, was, he was being sarcastic when he talked about funny yeah. little French cars, because mm. they really were... They were giant killers. And mm. not only in all those attributes we've mentioned, what we perhaps haven't talked about is the actual life of the car yeah. in service. Mm. I mean, those Peugeots would often do 70 or 80,000 miles mm. without any trouble at all. So they were very durable, not just in events like the Armstrong 500, but in real life Australian motoring. Mm. I mean, just the fact that Peugeot you know, built its own shock absorbers, I found that, that extraordinary. That tells you something. A yeah. really thoroughgoing company. It really was, wasn't yes, it? Yes, it was. Yeah. The much-loved 203's successor was the equally revered 403, with its more modern Pininfarina styling and larger 1.5-litre engine. But beneath those stylish Italian lines were the same rugged long-travel suspension, sublime handling and astounding rough road ride quality. This was proven by Riverina Graziers Wilfred Murrell and Alan Taylor, who won the first Ampole trial in 1956, which was just as long as the Red X trial it replaced. And it was hellishly tough, with only 34 of the original 113 starters reaching the finish. The first Armstrong 500 in 1960 was another event seemingly tailor-made for the 403, as the brittle track surface started to fall apart during the race. Not surprisingly, the French sedan thrived in such car-destroying conditions and was a runaway class winner, beaten only by the more powerful Vauxhall Cresta for outright line honours. It's not surprising that the Peugeot 203 and 403 command such adoration and respect amongst local French car fanatics, given their achievements in some of the toughest tests of automotive endurance. Remember to join the Shannons Club, where you can connect with other enthusiasts around the country. My name's Neil, uh, this is uh, a 1954 Peugeot 203. My name's Graham, this is a 1964 Peugeot 403B. I got this about 1999, 2000, was up in Ballarat and had been for sale for some period of time. Eventually I succumbed to its spell. My 403B started its life in Wagga Wagga, New South Wales and then ended up at Torquay, where I got onto it. My uh, 203, it's got rack and pinion steering, torque tube for the drive and worm drive at the back. Drum brakes, lever arm shock absorbers, and I've gradually sort of tidied up the bodywork a little bit since then. The motor in this one, it's balanced as I understand it to about a thousandth of a gram. to be enjoyed. That was a trick. It drives beautifully. 
My son, he'd driven all the way from Morty Alley. No sore back, no sore legs, and he said that was unusual, certainly for a car that's 64 years old. They're a car you could use every day. They were designed by engineers, not accountants. Great touring car. The 203 won the 53 Red X rally, and they've got themselves a history from then on. The 403, it, it was over here in the first Armstrong 500. It won its class. And I've got the photograph. Yeah, so his photograph's yeah. in black and white. The car was pink. I've probably been Shannon's customer for 25 years or so. I found that I needed somebody uh, who could handle older cars, and I'm very pleased with the result. They really are getting rare and few and far between these days, so uh, continue to look after it. Well, Shannon's National Auctions Manager, Chris Borobon, has dropped in to bring us up to speed on two of the classic Peugeots, the 203 and the 403. Uh, Welcome, mate. Yeah, John. Chris, the Peugeot 203, mm. I think of that as one of the most important post-war cars. Mm. And it was the first car to be sold in Australia that arguably did a better job than Australia's own at mm. handling our arduous conditions. So does this yep. mean the car is highly priced? And that's a really good question. And uh, no, it's not. I mean, you know, I think our Australian counterparts, the FX and FJs, have probably over, you know, yeah, over sure. the years become sure. very collectible. The 203 has been a bit forgotten about. Mm. Uh, there is still, there's a following in the club scene for yes. us, mm. but we, we're just not seeing the, uh, the traction that, you know, the Australian counterparts have obviously have gained. How about the 403? It probably lies in the same boat as well, I think. Mm. Yeah, yeah. But interesting, I mean, it's a car that, you know, obviously made its mark here in Australia through the Red X trials. Yeah, mm. that's right. Uh, you know, the success of that car. So yes. I think, that, you know, the club people appreciate that and actually get it. But, but I guess to the wider public, it's probably not quite there. And this is one of the points mm. we so often make on this segment, is that if you're looking for a really pristine old car, you're often best in the club scene. Mm. The Peugeot clubs are very, very mm. active they and are. they're very, very enthusiastic. Mm. And there is yeah. some great trips. I mean, they, they, they've done outback treks and all sorts of stuff oh, yeah. in these yeah. cars, so they really, yeah. they really use them for what, you know, what they were designed yeah, for. They do. But it's interesting, because both the uh, 203 and the 403 were locally assembled, of course, by yeah. um, Continental in general in mm -hmm. Melbourne. Would that sort of car, a locally assembled right-hand drive Peugeot, be more valuable you know, than bringing one in from overseas? I, I think it'd be more favoured, absolutely. Mm. Uh, if you know, if you can find a nice original 203 or 403, mm. um, you, you know, and that's the hard thing today is to find one that's been, you know, really well maintained or preserved. And I think, given that the value is not high, it's hard to find one that's had a lot of money spent to restore it mm. because, because obviously the final value is not there for it. And mm, there's yeah, a, yeah. a number of variations on both the 203 and the 403. Mm. But the mechanical concept was very interesting, you know, with the, particularly on the, on the 403 with the overdriven top gear mm. and third gear that would do, you know, like 65 miles an hour or something. Yeah. It's actually probably better on the open road than a Holden and steered better too. Mm. But I guess they're a bit of an arcane thing that not many people know about them. And that's probably, I think if we go back into Australia's history, especially going back in the 50s, I think, you know, the Peugeot was a French car, a bit unknown to the Australian community. and, and Until the Red X trial. Exactly right. right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And so was that maybe why, you know, the, we, the local cars were favoured over the, the imported cars potentially? Mm. Um, but, yeah, when you look at, you know, the history of the 203 and 403 and the success in the Red X trial and endurance races and, and how reliable those cars were, well, you, you start to say, well, actually, you know, these were, you know, quite robust cars. Mm. Yeah. And in the modern context, I must say the 203, you know, it is dated in its styling, but the 403, that pin in pin Farina, Farina yeah. body. You know, yeah. I mean, it, even today, I mean, it's obviously retro, but it still looks really good. That's still a very good looking car. It's, it is a, good looking it's car. a French it's American right. kind of thing. Mm. You know, Pin and Farina Italian design hats, obviously, mm. but that, that really has got American themes yes. expressed yep. in an understated very kind subtle. of European way. A very, mm. uh, very elegant car, really. Mm. Not the ones with the with the with the, the, the chrome flashes down the side, mm. yeah. but the original 403, quite a lovely looking car. So, what's the most desirable 203 or 403 on a global basis? Not not yeah. discounting what we didn't get here. Yeah, that's right. And I, it's a good question. I think mm. you know, 
we look at some of the variants we didn't get here, like the 203 Cabriolet or, oh, yeah. or the 403 Convertible. Mm. Oh, how beautiful. Yeah. The yeah. Colombo car. That's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's and, right. Mm. You know, and finding one of these is, is quite rare. You know, we, I have seen, you know, one or two examples here in Australia that have been imported over the years. Mm. So I think that's probably, you know, that would be at the top of the tree. And, and again, try and find one of those today. It's, Indeed. Yeah, yeah, pretty yeah, hard. Pretty hard. All right, mate, that's sound advice. Thanks, Chris. No problem. And for all the latest Shannon's auctions news, check out the Shannon's Club website. For your own competition image of the Peugeot 203 and 403, visit Autopic's comprehensive motorsport photo archive. It's interesting reflecting on these cars. I remember Ken Tubman said that when they did the 53 Red Axe, they had a dozen bottles of beer and a dozen bottles of wine in the back of that car. And they managed to get through them as they did the event, which I think just encapsulates the fun approach those guys had to that event. They were just going there to have a good time, but the yeah. car was so effortless over that hostile terrain that they, they found themselves in, in front. Look, it, it, it laid to rest the myth that you needed six cylinders or, or a V8 engine mm. for Australia. Mm. The Austin A40, which had, the Devon, which had been Australia's yeah. top selling car till Holden could get the numbers up, really was a fairly feeble four-cylinder car. Now, on paper, it looked to be the equal of the 203. It had mm. the same sort of top speed. The difference was the Austin was revving, mm. revving its, That's right. its head off to mm. do 70 miles an hour, whereas the 203 with its overdriven top gear, like a beetle, mm. was laid back. And wherever the road was flat, it could maintain that speed all day, mm. which was a higher cruising speed than you could manage safely in a Holden. Mm. So really, designed for France, Designed for the French colonies yep. in Africa and the West Indies and all those far-flung places and designed for Australia, perfect for Australia. Mm. So really a phenomenal car, the 203. And the 403 took all the same and built on it. Exactly. Yeah, they're certainly icons, weren't they, in Peugeot history? Indeed. Yeah. We hope you've enjoyed reflecting on the iconic 203 and 403 Peugeots. We hope you can join us next time for Shannon's Club TV. Bye for now.